Gracias por continuar con nosotros en Foro Global. En tu pantalla estaba la respuesta a la trivia de esta noche. Menos de dos semanas le tocó al gobierno de Pedro, Pedro Pablo Kuczynski darle el indulto al presidente, al expresidente Alberto Fujimori allá en Perú. Es momento de hacer el enlace Skype para la colaboración quincenal de Quartz, esta publicación de la Ciudad de Nueva York, que por supuesto te toca temas de política, pero también de tecnología. En esta ocasión me enlazo con Karen Hao, quien cubre los temas de tecnología para Quartz. Ella se especializó en temas ambientales y también en el clima, en la revista Sierra y Mother Jones. Antes de ingresar al periodismo, fue ingeniera de aplicaciones en Flux, una subsidiaria de Google X para la sostenibilidad urbana. Karen tiene un título en Ingeniería Mecánica por el Instituto Tecnológico de Massachusetts, el MIT, y se interesa actualmente por los temas de ciudades del futuro y su sustentabilidad. Karen, welcome to Foro Global. It's a pleasure having a conversation with you. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I was uh, just uh, reading your piece, uh, your, your piece for Quartz, and I, I read with a lot of interest. There are many stories, uh, many things to talk about it. But first, why don't you tell us a little bit about these digital currencies? Of course, the most popular one is Bitcoin, but it's not the only one. There are plenty of uh, digital currencies that many countries are still also starting to experience uh, with uh, for their markets. So Bitcoin is the first cryptocurrency that was ever created, but since then there have actually been many alternate currencies that have spun off. Um, and essentially what these cryptocurrencies are, um, during the 2008 financial crisis, there was a lot of public mistrust around centralized banks, which controlled the entire money supply. And so Bitcoin is this new kind of technology, this new kind of financial system um, that allows people to store money and exchange money without ever having to pass it through a centralized third party. And it's not only, of course, we're talking about a global market in which the dollar, the euro, the yen and many other like the regular coins are competing against each other in the in the trade markets. But now we have also these uh, digital currencies like uh, Bitcoin. You mentioned another one in your piece, which I can't remember the name. It's not only Bitcoin, but also NiceHash or NiceHash is a platform. So NiceHash is a platform, yes. It's an online website where essentially um, if you are someone with a computer and you have extra computational power on that computer, you can join this online network um, and offer your computational power to other people who can then pay you in Bitcoin um, to use your computational power to mine any kind of cryptocurrency. Well, you know, when I was a graduate student in the U.S., many of my colleagues, many of my classmates were working either at the library or were working in a coffee shop or in other places to get some extra money. But now in your piece, I read that uh, there are students, undergrads and also graduate students who spend their time in their dorms mining cryptocurrency. Why don't you tell us a little bit about this? That is correct. So through my reporting, I found that there are students around the world that are mining these cryptocurrencies in their dorm rooms using their university's free electricity. And some of them are doing it for the profit. Um, it can be very lucrative. In one instance, I talked with one student who estimates that he has earned around 20,000 US dollars in profit. Um, and in other instances, students were doing it because they really are curious about the technology and wanted to take the opportunity to understand it better. And w w what does it imply? I heard and I read in your piece also that these students solve mathematical problems. So that's the way to mine a cryptocurrency, right? Yes. So the way that you mine, quote unquote, um, these currencies is you actually just need some computational power. So um, most of the students that I spoke with, they just had a desktop computer or even a laptop. Um, and you can get a graphics card, which is traditionally mm -hmm. used for video editing or video gaming. And in this instance, is just helping you increase your computational power to mine more coins. Um, and once you have this system set up, you just um, can download software and start mining by running the software, um, or you can join these online platforms like NiceHash, as I mentioned in my piece, where you can um, put up your computational power for sale and mine uh, cryptocurrencies that other people want in exchange for payment. 
Sure. So mining cryptocurrencies, it's not for anybody. I mean, you need to know quantitative skills. You need to know how to solve mathematical problems. Also, I guess that you also need to know how to program, programming language. But also, uh, I mean, uh, what, what is the, 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 the earning? How much can a student who's actually spending a lot of time uh, mining cryptocurrencies, how much can they make per day or per week? So it really depends. Um, because cryptocurrency, the price is so volatile, um, you, can, you can make a few um, coins of a type of cryptocurrency and one day it could be a few dollars, the next day it could be a hundred dollars. So in the instance of Mark, the um, MIT student who's currently a junior there, he told me in December or in September when I spoke with him last year that after roughly um, several months of mining, he had earned one Bitcoin. And at the time, that was 4,500 USD. Wow. Um, and then by the time I asked him again in late December, early January, he told me that now he has $20,000 in USD. Wow. So yeah. it really varies how much you earn day to day. Um, and to your earlier point about how much technical skill you need to mine cryptocurrency, um, many of these students were technically sophisticated, and that's how they were introduced to the concept of mining in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, but there's actually, you don't really need that much technical knowledge um, because you essentially just have to download software that is already written for you onto your computer. And this software just runs in the background um, without you needing to do any kind of code or anything like that. Oh, well. And, and one last question. If I were a professor at MIT, I would be very worried about my students spending late night, uh, instead of starting for my class, mining cryptocurrency. What's the, the policy? What, what are universities doing regarding this? I mean, are students failing courses because they're spending much time mining? Or are they also ch charging them with more tuition because of the electricity cost, the extra electricity cost, or the, over, of the heating? Or, or what, what's going on? really great question. So um, in terms of what the universities are actually doing with this kind of information, now that they um, know that these students might be doing this activity, um, it's actually unclear whether they care or not. Um, the universities that I reached out to didn't respond mm -hmm. for comment. And all of the students that I spoke to told me that their universities hadn't actually prevented them from doing this kind of activity. So it's, it's difficult to gauge whether these universities just don't know which students are mining or if they don't really particularly care. Mm. Um, in terms of whether or not this might be a legal issue, um, I spoke with a lawyer at one point who specializes in cyber law. And he mentioned that he doesn't actually think these universities really know what to do with this just yet. Um, and they probably haven't put much thought into developing the legal framework to address whether they should allow this kind of activity. Yeah. Um, in terms of how much time these students are spending, it really varies across the board. So Mark, for example, the MIT student, um, he told me that he really doesn't spend much time uh, on this. Like he, he set up his mining operation and that did take some time, but now his day to day, he really doesn't do much. He might lightly maintain it for a few minutes a day. Um, but on the opposite end of the spectrum, I also spoke with this other student at Boston University um, who recently graduated, who said that when he first started, he got really into it and he basically skipped all of his classes wow. <laughs> just to learn more about mining and spend more time setting up and maintaining his um, computer, so it, it really it really varies. That's the academic uh, problem that a student that is mining uh, might uh, incur in if, if, if he continues on, of, on spending a lot of time doing this. Thank you so much, Karen, for this Minister Foro Global, and I hope to talk to you soon. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Thank you. Tú eres el futuro estudiantes que están desde sus habitaciones en las universidades ahora haciendo estas monedas digitales que del mercado. El artículo de Karen al final concluye diciendo que nadie sabe hacia dónde va este mercado de las eh, monedas digitales, pero que sin duda esto es tan solo el principio, lo que vamos a ver ya eh, bien entrado el siglo XXI. Soy Genaro Lozano, te agradezco mucho por haberme acompañado esta noche en Foro Global. Te dejo ahora en compañía de Eric Camacho y las noticias. Yo te espero mañana en punto de las 11 de la noche para una nueva emisión de Foro Global. Por lo pronto, muy buenas noches.